the third uh, lecture is the lecture of uh, Dr. Ilian Ekten. Dr. Ekten is a lecturer at the Department of Israel Studies at Haifa University. Her research focuses in the urban social history of Palestine and Israel <coughs> and uh, on housing in the 20th century. The title of her lecture is Between Mandate Authorities and Local Communities, Impoverished Numbers in Palestine, 1920-1945. Thank you for that presentation. And I would also like to express my gratitude um, to Professor Billy Melman and Professor Liat Kozma for extending the invitation to participate in the conference and would like to extend my thanks to the Israel Academy of Science. And especially, uh, I appreciate the work of Sima and Kochi, who dedicated efforts to organize this event and had much work done behind the scenes. So uh, I did modify the, uh, the um, periodization of my talk a little bit, and I did made it more concentrated on Tel Aviv. So my talk today will delve into the issue of Jewish impoverished neighborhoods in British Mandate Palestine, with a specific focus on housing in Tel Aviv, the flagship of Zionist urbanism, and the Jaffa regions. So whether you're well acquainted with the history of Tel Aviv or you're new to it, my intention today is to narrate this history through a less common perspective of both Zionist and British apprehension and mistrust of slums. In recent years, scholars have attempted to analyze urban marginal residential areas, adopting a nuanced, non-monolithic perspective on them and their inhabitants, while criticizing the categories used to describe them and the residential environments, and positioning these categories, categories in broader historical contexts. Alan Main has argued that the word slum itself represent a kind of fantasy for those who use it, as it encompasses a wide, right, a wide range of human habitations and situation, situations. He emphasizes that the term is primarily used by those who view slums from the outsider's view, often neglecting the experience of the people who reside within these areas. At the same time, the discussion of slum is obviously inseparable from both colonial and post-colonial histories and heritage and the continuities between the two, as well as questions on the relations between the global now, so south and north to this day. The term slums itself find, um, first gained usage in English language in the early 19th century. In Mandate Palestine, like in other territories under the British Empire, the term slums even found its way into local language usage. In Hebrew, it appears at times in transliteration, slums, and at times in English brackets next to the term mishkanot, or, mishkanot oni. So if you know Hebrew, um, you know what I'm saying. And if not, it's just saying um, poverty residential area. In my talk, I will interchangeably use both terms, slum and impoverished neighborhoods, to reflect both contemporary discussions and perception, and to encompass the broader perspective on the living conditions of urban poor communities. So the first segment of this lecture will delve into the evolution of slums around the Tel Aviv area, and the stance taken by both the Tel Aviv municipality and the mandate government in relations to these areas. The latter segment of this lecture will spotlight the initiatives of the residents within these neighborhoods and their interactions with the authorities. The emergence of impoverished neighborhoods on the outskirts of major cities in Palestine, both Muslim, Christians, and Jewish residential neighborhoods, um, are, uh, which were at times to a high degree of um, mixed neighborhoods of cohabitation, was a notable consequence of the rap rapid urban development in Palestine in the late 19th century. This trend was, of course, rooted in the local context of the development of the region under the late Ottoman Empire and the increasing European engagement in Palestine. At the same time, these trends of urban development could not be understood completely in isolation from urbanization patterns seen in Europe during the late 19th century and early 20th centuries, raising significant concerns relating to sanitation, public health, social concerns, and moral considerations. In response to the challenging, uh, to the challenging challenges posted, 
uh, by the development of modern urban slums in the metropolitan uh, areas in Europe. A prominent alternative emerged, which was already mentioned here today, the Garden City model, initiated, uh, initially proposed by Ibn Ezra Howard in 1898. So this innovative approach to urban planning sought to address the problems associated with the crowded, unsanitary, impoverished neighborhoods by promoting well-planned, green, and self-sustaining communities. The Garden City model aimed to offer an alternative to the deteriorating living conditions in rapidly expanding industrial urban areas. Scholars have shown that Howard's ideas not only found traction in West and Eastern Europe, but also resonated in various colonial settings where they played a crucial role in creating residential spaces for European settlers. In contrast to Howard's model, which was influenced by anarchist and socialist ideas, these garden cities often promoted segregation between different populations. The garden city, con the gar garden city concept influenced the design and development of residen residential spaces, mostly under the French colonial rule, for example, in West Africa, Dakar, in North Africa, in Morocco, in East Africa, in Zanzibar. Garden city style neighborhoods allowed French settlers a completely different quality of life and life experience than the indigenous inhabitants who lived in other segments of the same cities. The garden city model, as some of you may well know, was also important and was also imported and put into practice in 20th century Palestine. Garden city neighborhoods were seen by prominent figures in the Zionist movement, like Theodor Herzl and Arthur Rupin, as an alternative to the living conditions of Jews in Europe and in the older cities of Palestine, such as Jaffa and Jerusalem. One of its earliest implementations was witnessed by the establishing of a Khuzat Bayt, a neighborhood in Jaffa in the year 1909, which was led by Akiva Arya Weiss. This neighborhood was pri primarily promoted by a group of Jewish immigrants who arrived in Palestine from Europe in the previous years and were residing in Jaffa. However, the establishment of the mandate accelerated urban development processes all over Palestine and in the Tel Aviv region in particular. Under the mandate, Ahuzad Bayt expanded rapidly, evolving into the city of Tel Aviv. By 1921, it was designated a local council under the Jaffa municipality and ultimately gained independence as a city by 1934. The core of Tel Aviv was characterized by wide street houses with surrounding gardens and uh, focused on providing modern and hygienic environment. This is a Khuzad Bayt. However, as the city continued to grow, it became clear that this model represented only a small portion of the overall urban space. Whether through the annexation of pre-existing neighborhoods um, constructed um, in the late 19th century uh, that were formerly part of Jaffa, and whether uh, it was the formation of new neighborhoods under the mandate, the Khuzat Bayt and the modern neighborhoods adjacent to it found themselves surrounded by slum areas of very, various characteristics stretching to the west, south, east, and even north of the city. So one segment, as I mentioned, was the older neighborhoods um, of late in, built in late, in, late 19th century, uh, like the mixed Jewish Arab neighborhoods of Neve Shalom and Manshia. And another segment was those neighborhoods who were built during the first decades of the mandate. During the 1920s, with the surge in Jewish immigration to Palestine, the housing shortage was intensified and was combined with severe, several economic crises. Between 1923 and 1925, the city counted 34 barracks and tent camps with, within its limits. The number of shacks within the city increased in the latter half of the 1920s and reached 1,921 by 1927. So, but by 1927, several Jewish shack neighborhoods were situated south of Tel Aviv. Um, sorry within the Jaffa municipality boundaries, including areas like the Maccabi neighborhood, Givat Herzl, Givat Moshe, and Ovid. The emergence of these provisional neighborhoods was also connected to the evolving national conflict in Palestine. The departure of Jewish residents from Jaffa following the events of May 1921 promoted the establishment of the Shack Tents neighborhood known as Nordia. Um, that was also nicknamed the Houseless Neighborhoods, which you see in front of you. This neighborhood was built on lands who were owned partly by the Jewish National Fund and originally designed to, um, as a Garden City neighborhood to be named after Max Nordau. 
So shack neighborhoods were typically built either on private lands owned uh, by private owners or owned by the Jewish National Funds with, Fund with residents leasing the land uh, for, their, for their makeshift homes. This occasionally led to disputes between the shack dwellers and the landowners who demanded their evictions. According to an economic survey uh, conducted by economist Fritz Naftali in 1934, around one-tenth of the Jewish population in several major cities lived in temporary wooden shacks, in, uh, wooden and, sh and tin shacks. This um, variety of neighborhoods played an integral role in Tel Aviv's development as a modern city and affected the city's image and ran counter to urban planning and urban ideals of Tel Aviv's founder and leaders. Throughout the mandate period, municipal authorities consistently criticized these neighborhoods and the quality of life they offered. Notably, there was an ethnic dimension to the perception of impoverished neighborhoods. While poverty zones also housed Jewish immigrants from Europe, who, as we well know, came to form most of the population of Tel Aviv and the Jewish uh, population in Palestine overall during the mandate period, the association of impoverished neighborhoods was predominantly with the Orient and Oriental Jews. For instance, Dr. Natan Benatan published a comprehensive study in the journal published by the Tel Aviv municipality in the summer of 1937 titled Population Density and Rent of the Poor Classes in Tel Aviv. In this study, he describes the Keremate Manim area, which was one of the uh, older neighborhoods uh, built before Khuzad Bayit, as a neglect part of Asian slums. And the Mashia neighborhood as suffering from a lack of sidewalks and roads, sewage issues, a stench of garbage, garbage piles, and a deficient sanitary service. On its behalf, the British administration in Palestine also acknowledged the necessity to address the issue of impoverished neighborhoods. In line with other aspects of urban space management, this primarily involved the implementation of regulatory measures which were important partly from Britain itself and partly from other colonial spaces. For example, the municipal ordinance of 1934 marked a significant development as it regarded the municipal, as it granted the municipal authorities control over, over various aspects, including, and I'm citing, building, building construction, demolition, alteration, and repair, prohibiting or regulating building based on class, design, or appearance, and inspection of houses and buildings to assess cleanness and address pest issues such as rat, mice, and vermin. The town planning ordinance of 1936 aimed to eradicate slums in Palestine cities, emphasizing the town planning schemes were intended, among other things, for the, and I'm quoting, abolition and reconstruction of overcrowded and congested areas. However, in practice, um, due to high expenses associated with demolitions and reconstruction, as well as operational limitation, large-scale measures by municipalities and the government were challenged to implement. So I'm not referring to anything that happens under uh, military um, operations that also involves demolishing uh, large part and segments of cities, but rather something that is defined as slum clearance. An exception in the intervention of the uh, British Mandate Palestine government occurs during World War II, when the government, fearing the spread of plague, intervenes in liquidation of slums in Tel Aviv. In 1934, an extraordinary operation was launched to dismantle the Argazim neighborhood after a case of plague was discovered nearby in November 1942. The Tel Aviv municipality um, also advocated the demolition of other wooden shacks around the harbor and uh, other locations across the city. So the government temporarily lifted restrictions on building materials that were uh, placed during the war and allowed the construction of housing for evacuees of these barracks. By 1944, a total of 440 evacuees were resettled in the new permanent residential uh, areas designed for them. During the war, urban housing challenges reached a critical point, um, promoting the government to act. So following the Second World War, the government introduced a comprehensive urban development plan known as the 1945 Emergency Building Scheme, EBS. It was aimed at addressing the housing shortage. This shortage was a consequence of reduced civil construction activity during the war and the influx of residents who, uh, who were employed by the mandate government and moved to the major cities during the, the wartime. 
the anticipation to um, the anticipation of Palestine Pal Palestine's residents who served in the British Army and the arrival of Jewish refugees from Europe after the war um, made expectation for the urban crisis to worsen. However, in practice, the, gov the government's primarily post-war intervention focused on providing governmental assistance to the establishments of neighborhood dedicated to discharge Jewish soldiers. So thanks to this support, one notable outcome was the construction of the Yad Eliyahu neighborhood located across the Vadi Musrara, uh, also known as the Ailan Creek. So Yad Eliyahu, along with the neighborhoods established for the plague of Akhuis, played a pivotal role in the expansion of Tel Aviv into its eastern periphery. So up until now, I have briefly explored the development of informal settlement in and around Tel Aviv, as well as dissatisfaction of the Tel Aviv municipality and British authorities regarding these neighborhoods. Uh, in the upcoming part of the lecture, I will pivot to examine the local communities residing within these neighborhoods and explore their interactions with various authorities and bodies. So despite being perceived as a problem, the residents of these slum neighborhoods actively sought to ensure that their needs were recognized by the authorities. For instance, by 1926, the Association of Tents and Barrack Residents in Tel Aviv pressured the municipality to purchase land for tents and shacks construction. In 1928, the Neve Shalom neighborhood mentioned previously, the Neve Shalom neighborhood committee, which has been an act to Tel Aviv in 1923, appealed to the district officer due to what they perceived as neglect by the Tel Aviv municipality, which they criticized sharply. We cannot sit idle and wait until the Tel Aviv municipality can pay any attention to the needs of this abandoned community. From here, we decided to turn to the government. We beg the Honorable to ensure that this vital amendment is implemented without further delay, and so that the government finds the financial part to collect in small annual payments from the property owners. We are certainly dissatisfied with the management of the Tel Aviv municipality. They are probably thinking only about burdening us with heavy taxes and giving the neighborhood very little in return. In the, fourth and last, in the forthcoming and last section of the lecture, I will delve even more deeply into an examination of the interactions between the residents of one specific impoverished neighborhood called Hatikva that was established during the latter half of the, 20, the 30, 1930s uh, and their interactions with both governmental and municipal authorities. The purpose of this examination is to reveal how this uh, marginalized local community appealed to the institutions to promote its own needs. So Hatikva was situated east of Tel Aviv, like the neighborhoods I mentioned before, across from the Wadi Musrara, which served as a natural boundary, effectively isolating it from both the cities of Tel Aviv and the city of Jaffa. While formerly it fell outside the jurisdiction of any municipality, Hatikva was conceived as a satellite neighborhood, and its residents relied on a nearby city for their livelihood and essential services. Atikva presented a stark, stark contrast to the more modern and planned neighborhoods of early Tel Aviv. It was a densely populated area characterized by wide story houses arranged in a grid-like structure with narrow streets. Remarkably, the neighborhood had few public spaces and its layout uh, bore a striking resemblance to the characteristics commonly associated with what we would call a slum or a favela. Moreover, the Atikva demographic and socioeconomic makeup diverge from the envisioned modern European and bourgeoisie characteristic that the leadership of Tel Aviv, known as the first Hebrew city, sought to install to their city. The overwhelming majority of Tel Aviv inhabitants were Jews of Oriental descent, um, Zahi Jews, mostly members of the Sephardi and Yemeni communities, belonging to the lower working class. They earned their livelihood through temporary employment opportunities in Tel Aviv, taking the roles of housekeepers, peddlers, and street cleaners. Throughout the 1940s, the residents of Atikva tirelessly strived for official recognition and representations, representation um, of their concerns and interests. In the early 1940s, the residents attempted to elect a representative committee for official recognition by the Madrid authorities. They established an election commission, uh, composed an electoral constitution, which you see here, and um, this constitution was directly sent to the district officer. Following the residents' initial steps for establishing a local elections, various groups approached the district officer simultaneously requesting to be endorsed as the residents' representatives. 
However, the district officer notified all residents who wrote to him that he could not confirm the existence of any elected committee because the government did not supervise such an activity. In response to the pressure um, for the election of a local representative, the district officer decided to appoint a muhtar who would be responsible for managing the neighborhood. So as you well know, a muhtar is an administrative status position that the mandate authorities adopted from the Ottoman local government system and uh, adjusted to the their own governmental needs. The muhtar oversaw the management of, an inter of internal affairs of a settlement, whether it be a village, a neighborhood, or a colony, and mediated between the authorities and the residents. The decision to appoint a muhtar for Tikva triggered an additional wave of requests from the residents. The neighborhood committee recommended candidates, and by November 1941, the position of the muhtar was officially entrusted by Shayao Israel, an early resident of the neighborhood who was of Yemeni descent. Along their efforts to establish a representative body, the residents of Atikva also engaged in various collective initiatives to enhance the involvement of Tel Aviv municipality, the government, and also various Zionist institutions in addressing the neighborhood's needs. One notable endeavor was the formation of a water committee, which advocated for the Tel Aviv municipality to intervene in regulating water supply in the neighborhood. This supply was controlled by two private institutions. And the residents organize and demonstrate involving both adults and children right in front uh, to demonstrate what in, right in front of the municipality. One tangible impact of their action became evident in the summer of 1944 when representatives of the municipality, along with journalists and members of the Tel Aviv Worker Council, visited the neighborhood to inspect the water situation. Another aspect the residents took upon themselves was to address the issue of garbage disposal. And here we see the market, the, the Tikva market, which was uh, causing a lot of sanitary problems. Prior to the Mushra's appointment, the neighborhood, a neighborhood resident named Yechezkel Shoshani uh, managed the garbage removal process and collected fees for his service. Following World War II, uh, a cooperative consisting of discharged soldiers um, was formed in the neighborhood and was collaborating with the Tel Aviv municipality to tackle the neighborhood unique challenges while also offering employment opportunities for its members. In the summer of 1948, after, after several months of intense fighting around the neighborhood, the sanitary crisis in Atikva reached its climax. Streets were littered with piles of garbage and rabid animals roamed around the streets, posing a significant danger, particularly to children. In response to this dire situation, a joint committee representing the Hatikva and Ezra neighborhood, which was next to it, urgently approached a member of the Tel Aviv Municipal Council to seek assistance in organizing garbage removal within the neighborhood. The committee stressed the inherent, inherent risk associated with the filth, stating, and I quote, the entire neighborhood is, is buried in heaps of garbage, and there's potential outbreak of various disease. This is not only a danger to the neighborhood residents, but also poses a threat to the entire city of Tel Aviv, as there, is no, as there is no impenetrable barrier between the neighborhood and Tel Aviv. OK, um, I have one more segment that deals with education, but I'm going to skip it, so I'll have time to conclude. Um, so. In uh, my talk today, I focus on the dynamic interplay between urban development and planning, government and municipal authorities, and local disadvantaged communities in Tel Aviv under the British mandate. We observed that even though, even before the mandate period, the fear of uh, slums played a significant role in the establishment of Tel Aviv and the adoption of the Garden City model to build a Khuzat Bayit. When examining the development during the British Mandate, we witnessed that impoverished neighborhoods played an integral role in making Tel Aviv an urban modern city. Phenomena derived directly from the Mandate regime, among them rapid urbanization, increased migration, and national conflict, led to the emergence of various types of impoverished neighborhoods on the outskirts of the city. This development ran counter to the ambitions of the Tel Aviv municipality and the British government to form what was perceived as a plan and modern urban space. Focusing on a Tikva neighborhood, east of Tel Aviv, we uncover that the residents forms representative bodies advocated for just water supply, and believe me, initiated educational project and stage protest. The residential actions were not isolated incidents. 
They symbolize the broader struggle for recognition, representation, and equality of life amid a rapidly changing urban landscape under the British Mandate in Palestine. The persistence of marginalized communities in shaping their own environmental environments emphasize the importance of community mobilization, civic engagement, and the pursuit of improved living conditions in the face of adversity. These lessons remain relevant in contemporary efforts for social justice and equality in urban development, both in what is termed today the global south and the global north, or may be perceived as colonial and post-colonial space. Thank you.